السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبيه ومصطفاه وبعد My dear respected viewers, my dear brothers and sisters Welcome to another live episode of Ask Huda And our phone numbers in the beginning of this episode is A code 002-0238-5131 A code 002-0100-0546-9323 WhatsApp numbers, uh, code 001-347-80625. Uh, finally, another WhatsApp number, uh, code 001-361-489-1503. And uh, we're well, live on my page, Am Salah Official, the Facebook, and also Ask a Muslim Facebook page. Let me begin by taking some of your uh, pending questions. Zina Huth. Zinath Hussein is asking, I want to know if I can have fake nails for a few weeks. My intention of having fake nails is to get rid of the habit of nail biting. And uh, I don't want to have long nails for style purposes. My concern is for Salah and Wudu. Will it be valid while wearing fake nails? One of the conditions of the wudu is al-mubashara, where the water must reach every body part, which is indicated in the ayah of Surah Al-Ma'idah. What should be washed? إِذَا قُمْتُمْ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ فَاغْسِلُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ وَأَيْدِيَكُمْ إِلَى الْمَرَافِقِ وَامْسَحُوا بِرُؤُوسِكُمْ وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ When the Prophet وسلم, saw some people, when they came to pray, and their heels seemed to be dry, like, you know, the rest of their feet is washed, but some spots, he said, وَيْلُوا لِلْأَعْقَابِ مِنَ النَّارِ So he warned that this body part, which has not been washed, or the water did not reach during wudu, invalidates the wudu. And if this is the case, that it invalidates the prayer as well. Woe to those who do not wash their heels, or the water does not reach that part of their feet. So there is an agreement that if there is anything against a body part which should be washed during wudu, it must be removed first. If we have a painter, a mechanic, who are having some wax over their hands or paint on their arms, it must be removed first in order to make wudu because this paint or this wax acts as a barrier, it prevents the water from reaching the skin. So in this case, the wudu becomes incomplete and invalid. The nails are included in the hands. So one must wash the hands, including the nails. That's why even mere wearing nail polish that leaves a layer that stands as a barrier between the water and the nails and that will make the wudu invalid. Similarly, wearing fake nails on top of the nails will prevent the water from reaching the nails, and that would invalidate the wudu and accordingly invalidate the prayer. May Allah guide us to what is best. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Lubna from Poland, I have one question for you. Uh, I always pray with the timetable of my local masjid because we don't have any adhan uh, in my country. And then the clock is correct, for accurate. But when I went to the masjid, they did not pray according to their timetable, but they delayed the prayer. The second time, the same thing happened, so I started to pray at home again. But yesterday, I had a meeting with some sisters, and they did not pray. And the same thing happened with Asr. So I asked the 
Teda, why are you delaying the prayer? And she said, yeah, because the timetable, it's not uh, correct uh, uh, all, uh, all the time. It's not okay. It's okay to pray a little bit later. So I'm, I, please, uh, can you clarify for me? Did I, I, I did not feel okay to pray so late. And the prayer as well, it went very fast. They went so quick that I did not finish my surah and I went to Rukur. I have not good feeling of my prayer. Do I have to do it all over again? And please clarify the timetable for me. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Lubna from uh, Poland. Or Holland, I believe. Taib. Sister Lubna, Lubna, with regards to the timetable, you can just simply resort to Islamic finder timetable. It's kind of accurate. And also I'd like to add sometimes we have a timetable for the Adhan or for the entrance of the prayer time. But in the Masjid, in Dhuhr, they postpone it 20 minutes or an hour, especially in Europe and in the States, hoping more people will be able to come during the lunch break. And also the Prophet ﷺ recommended delaying the Dhuhr for Al-Ibrad, those who come to the Masjid when it's really hot. So he would delay it for an hour or so for the weather to cool down a little bit because it's really hot whenever the sun is in the middle of the sky. But the prayer time begins with the timetable. So if you're praying at home, at the convenience of your air conditioned air condition office or a bedroom, you can just simply pray whenever it is the beginning of the prayer time. Like time with Isha. The Isha prayer, the recommendation is to delay the Isha prayer if it is okay with the community members, if they can afford to come late for it. But for people who are praying at home or praying in their offices, uh, they can simply pray as soon as the Adhan is called, if they can hear the Adhan, or as soon as the prayer time is due according to the timetable. Secondly, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Idris from the USA, Assalamu alaikum. Idris, Assalamu alaikum. Okay, I, I can hear you as well. I just got my question and hope that you gave me. Uh, I have a couple of questions. My first question is uh, what my son was actually asking me. Uh, so, on the day of judgment, after it's said and done, and you know, the people of Paradise, inshallah, we have amongst them and those Paradise, uh, will the angels be in Paradise still? Uh, so, that, that's the first question. My mm -hmm. second question uh, is uh, a little bit, uh, I mean, I guess a little bit more complex. Uh, I uh, used to live in Alaska, and back when I was living there, we, uh, I remember we got a fatwa in, in terms of uh, the way to pray, because uh, during some months, we don't get uh, night time, uh, especially the, the further north you go, like, they, they don't get night time at all. So the, the part that I was given was they follow Saudi Arabia. And I was doing that just fine back when I was living there. Uh, but now I'm getting to move back over there. Uh, but I'm where I am in faith is a little bit different now. Uh, so now I'm a little bit more worried. I'm not as comfortable as uh, I was back then in just following Saudi Arabia. So there's like 30 group of people. Some people follow the local time. Some people follow, I, I believe some people try to follow like Seattle, like the closest place to us, mm -hmm. and others follow Saudi Arabia. The main masjid, majority of people follow Saudi Arabia because that's the password that we were given. So to be able to like do Juma, to be able to pray in the masjid and all of that, I would have to follow Saudi Arabia. So uh, I need to the people that I know that follow local time. I know a brother who follow local time, for instance, he said even he can't pray in Isha because uh, during the summer. If you pray my group, you pray my group like close to midnight, and then you pray the Shah along with the market. He said as a pathway guy that he, he, he combines Mokra and Shah. So he does that every day during the summer. Uh, so my question to you is what, what do I do as I'm getting ready to go back there now, knowing that the majority of the people follow local time? So, so for me to be with the Jama'a, I mean, no, excuse me, not local time. For me to do with the Jama'a, I need to follow Saudi Arabia time. That's what the majority of people do. So I don't feel as comfortable with that now. But do I do it in the name of being with the Jama'a or do I do something different? 
so I hope uh, you heard my question and understand my question. Yes, I got your questions. I got your questions, brother Idris from the USA. Okay, uh, Sister Lubna from Holland had another question with regards to uh, the Imam was so fast in the prayer that she couldn't even recite Al Fatiha with the Imam, or she was, um, you know, she wasn't able to catch up with the Imam. One of the conditions of the validity of the prayer is and khushu'a, which means, as the Prophet وسلم, stated, when he corrected one of the companions who was not praying properly, he prayed two rak'ahs, then he came swiftly and he came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, Assalamu alaikum. So the Prophet وسلم, greeted him back and he said, Arja fasalli fa lam tusalli. He said, My friend, go back and pray again. You have not prayed yet. So he did that. And when he returned, the Prophet ﷺ advised him with the same. And that happened three times. So in the third time, the man said, I do not know any better, so teach me. So the Prophet ﷺ taught him how to pray. This hadith is known as Hadith al-Musi'i Salatahu, the person who did not know how to pray well. And in the program of uh, Hajj Step by Step, um, I explained this hadith in details and how the Prophet ﷺ required in this hadith At-Tuma'nina. So, When you bow down, you make ruku' until you attain tranquility. And you say tasbih with tranquility. Then, arfa' So, raise your head and stand up again until you reach the position of Tuma'nina or uh, serenity, tranquility, and you have a full posture while standing. What people do of hitting and running, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and the followers of the Mu'mumin are racing to catch up with them that invalidate the prayer. So in this case, what should a Mu'mum, a follower do? If the Imam was so fast that he wasn't able to even recite Surah Al-Fatiha, this is the first rak'ah, and um, I assume everybody is reciting the beginning supplication, Dua ul Istiftah. I was about to recite it, and he said, Allahu Akbar. I couldn't even recite Surah Al-Fatiha. Then I tried to catch up with the ruku' with the Imam. So I said, Allahu Akbar. I wasn't able to say, Subhana Rabbi al azim not even once. In this case, Tanwi lin farad. You make an intention of praying alone, like you did not join the jama'ah from the beginning. So you pray on your own with tranquility. You recite your Fatiha with comfort, then the Surah, then make Rukur properly, stand up properly, and resume with the prayer, even if he finishes before you, because you intended alin farad to pray on your own. And this is a message that we send to the Imam that you should neither be too long and boring, nor too fast to the extent that there is ikhlal, that the ma'mum, the follower, could not even catch up with the imam. That is not permissible. The Prophet wasallam forbade in the prayer, naqruddika, which makes the musalli, the person who's offering the prayer, resembling the rooster picking up the grains from the ground. Hit and run, pick quickly. So you see him making incomplete ruku', incomplete sujood, and so swift that the, the prayer loses that part of it which is known as khushu', and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put it as a condition for success in the beginning of Surah Al-Mu'minun. The first quality of those who are successful among the believers, qadi aflah al-mu'minun, alladheena hum fi salatihim khashi'oon. Idris from the USA, he had two questions. He asked um, first about being in Alaska where they didn't have like the regular uh, daytime and nighttime. So in this case, they were following Mecca or they were following the timetable of uh, you know Mecca and Medina and so on. 
In the hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stated when the false Messiah will come on earth and will stay for a certain number of days, one day will be as long as one year, one day will be as long as one month, and another will be as long as one week, and so on. The companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were very concerned about the prayers of Prophet of Allah. If the length of this one day, and this is not the hereafter yet, this is in the dunya, and where we're obliged to offer the prayer. So one day will be equivalent to 360 plus days. How are we going to pray? Is it going to be only five daily prayers or how are we going to offer our prayers after this call, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Um Muhammad from the UK. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you? I'm doing fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking, Sister Um Muhammad. Go ahead. Alhamdulillah. Uh, Sheikh, I have three questions, if, if that's possible, please. Okay. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to ask your advice, please, on um, giving dawah to a non-Muslim. I know this is a very popular question, but um, and I know it probably takes a series rather than a few minutes to explain, but I've been asked um, a series of questions by a Catholic uh, sister who who's asking the sort of normal misconceptions misconceived mm. uh, questions with regards to the veil and um, polygamy and etc um, uh, I would like apart from just answering those questions I, I don't know I've never really been in this position where I need to sort of think about where I start you know um, what, what what would I what would I say to her first before answering those questions to sort of put things in the right place? Mm. Um, that's, that's, um, that's one question. Um, the second question relates to this, really. Um, the sister who we're questioning here, she's, uh, she's an Italian sister. Now, although I speak Italian, my, um, my ability to explain some of the answers to her, I don't think I would do it, the, the religion its duty and answer correctly or, or as in depth as I would in English. Um, I've been looking online to see if I can find some Italian shakes that I could listen to and, and feel comfortable with their answers, but I've, I failed really. And I was just wondering whether you would personally be able to recommend anybody who speaks Italian and that you know and trust and, and I could get in contact with um, or put them in contact, for example. Okay, I will be more than happy to do that, inshallah. So, Sister Umu Muhammad. That's question number two. Okay, if you have any questions uh, now, you can present uh, them. Otherwise, you can collect my contact uh, from the control, inshallah. Just one more question, please, Sheikh. Sure. Um, again, the question that many, you've heard many times. Um, with regards to um, spirit vinegar or um, wine vinegar in the presence of food such as for example like mayonnaise or if you buy a salad that's got wine vinegar in there um i i was under the understanding originally that if um if it was in the food then avoid the food um uh, and and so i have done up until now although i heard something not so long ago which said that basically if the food is so minimal that you can't intoxicate yourself on um even if you eat a large quantity of it then it's it's you are you can have it um yeah i just wanted some clarity on that please okay thank you sister um muhammad from the uk so back to idris question the prophet sallallahu said to the companions who were concerned about their prayer in this super lengthy day so long one day will be as long as one year of our time and one day will be as long as one month of our time, and another will be as long as one week of our time, then the rest of the days will be like our regular days. This is concerning the false Messiah. So they asked, how are we going to pray? He said, اقدروا لهذا اليوم قدره. So we estimate how many prayers we pray within 24 hours, you know, the time difference between each two prayers then we estimate that and we keep praying even though it's daytime all the time. But we would not just pray five daily prayers, no. We'll pray within 24 hours, whatever the prayers that we use to pray during regular times. So the scholars 
concluded from that. If we are in the North Pole, if we are somewhere where there is day time for six months and night time for another six months, how do we pray? We pray according to the nearest geographical location where it has day and night. So we follow that. There is an opinion which says it follows Ummul Qura, especially with uh, fasting. But now if you have a nearby city where it has a day and night and they have a timetable, so you would follow that insha'Allah and that will be uh, sufficient, Brother Idris. Secondly, with regards to Al-Malaika and will there be angels in Al-Jannah? Uh, of course, yes. There are many Quranic verses which stated that the both Jannah and Nar do exist now and they have both Khazana, guards of the uh, gods of heavens and gods of hellfire. And they are created and they are doing their tasks as they were commanded. What I need to bring to your attention that Al-Malaika, the angels, are different than the human beings in the jinn with regards to the concept of uh, takalif and the free choice. Since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stated in Surah At-Tahreem that they were created to uh, genuinely obey Allah without the choice of disobedience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون The reward and the punishment is for those who are given the free choice. So they, those who chose to obey, to worship, to believe in the oneness of Allah will be compensated with the reward. And those who abused this choice and they refused obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they disbelieved in His oneness, obviously will be compensated by being punished. But in the case of Al-Malaika, we find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the angels, um, that when we enter Al-Jannah, insha'Allah, in Surah Al-Ra'd, he said, جَنَّاتُ عَدْنِي يَدْخُلُونَهَا وَمَنْ صَلَحَ مِنْ آبَائِهِمْ وَأَزْوَاجِهِمْ وَذُرِّيَّتِهِمْ وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ يَدْخُلُونَ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ كُلِّ بَابٍ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِمَا صَبَرْتُمْ فَنِعْمَ عُقُبَ الدَّارِ So the angels will keep entering upon the believers in Al-Jannah, serving them, guarding them, helping them. And they will greet them with the greeting of peace. Salamun alaykum bima sabartum. Peace be with you. As you endured the life of this world patiently, as you fulfill the commandments and you abstain from the prohibitions. How excellent is such a return and abode. وَقِيلَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ This ayah also is of Surah Az-Zumar. So they will exist on the Day of Judgment and they will exist in Jannah and they will exist also as gods of hellfire as well. But also keep in mind that uh, on the Day of Judgment and prior to it when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says كُلُّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَا فَانْ وَيَبَقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ Everything that exists on it shall perish except Allah the Almighty, okay? He is without beginning and without an end. So even the angels will die. Jibreel alayhi salam will die. Israfil, who will blow in the trumpet, will die. Including the angel of death himself will die. Allah will take his soul. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will resurrect all the human beings, the jinn, the animals, all the living creatures for reckoning and accountability. Barakallahu feekum. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Sister Saadiya from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. I just have one question. I want to know what's the difference between a moment's death and a shaheed's death because uh, I've heard shaheed only feels the sting of an ant it's like not no pain at all and they go straight to Jannah that means I guess they do not go to cover either I just wanted to know that and so uh, if it's uh, 
it's so easy to ask for the death of a shaheed even if you die in on, in bed then why don't everybody uh, ask for it uh, i mean the status of shaheed is so great don't we ask for it i mean it's not common not many people know about it Thay thank you sister Sayyida Saadiyah from the KSA. Uh, <clears throat> Sister Ummu Muhammad from the UK, uh, I'm glad, alhamdulillah, uh, you're involved in da'wah. And if you're involved in da'wah, you will be confronted with many misconceptions. And all those misconceptions are old, or most of them are old and being renovated, like uh, recycled. Refuting them is a matter of learning how to re refute them because it's like very simple piece of cake. We don't have to make up any uh, uh, refutation. Uh, we don't have to invent the wheel, just learn how to roll it. That's very simple. And we teach such class at the university. It's called Islamic Thoughts, Refuting Misconceptions. And the hijab is something was, which was not only prescribed in, uh, in, in, in the Sharia ah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if the lady who's talking to you is Catholic, if she looks into the picture, the image of uh, Mary, peace be upon her, uh, she would realize that she's wearing hijab. And if she, she's in Italy, ask her why the nuns are wearing hijab in, uh, in the Vatican and uh, everywhere else. And why do women who, have, who, who enter the Vatican have to wear hijab if they are allowed to enter? Also, just a few decades ago, all over Europe, you could see the common dress, which was a typical hijab. Uh, Mormons um, and um, some denominations of uh, Christianity until today in the USA, when I visit those areas, women are wearing hijab. Saturday morning, when you see the Jews are going to their synagogues, you think that Muslim community are going for their Friday worship. Uh, Muslim wo uh, women are wearing a uh, hijab. So it is not something unprecedented. It is something that Allah prescribed for women for the modesty of both men and women in the society. Then we can prove that uh, logically and from a social point of view through some of the experiments that those people who have uh, done it in, uh, in New York City, showing the sexual harassment, the rate of the sexual harassment towards a woman who is wearing a revealing cloth and exposing her beauty versus the same woman who happened to walk the same walk, the same distance, the same time while wearing um, aba'a or a preliminary hijab, simple hijab. For so many hours, I believe it was six hours, there was zero harassment versus the same woman wearing, uh, you know, what normally women wear nowadays whenever they're going out or going to the moon. It's not very revealing clothes, but it's not hijab. And not a single walk in every corner, in every shop that passes by, by every group of men who are standing and watching, passing by, she was harassed and picked on. Uh, of course, that does not justify what wrong the people are doing, what men are doing. But I'm talking about the hijab was prescribed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the modesty of the entire uh, community. Uh, of course, for further more education in this regard, I said I'll be more than happy uh, if you want to collect my number and if you want to uh, the sister to have a chat with me, I'll be more than happy to do that, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Umar from Bahrain, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. How are you, Sheikh, and all your Huda TV crew? Ahlan wa sahlan. Uh, Welcome to the program. Alhamdulillah. Sheikh, I have two questions. The first question is regarding uh, the Sunnah act of praying. For example, we have Hadith narrated, uh, was saying that Allail uh, matna, you are praying to Raqqat. Yes. But uh, in some uh, teaching, can say that uh, you, if you decide to pray for Raqqa, and for example, when you pray, is it permissible to pray two Raqqas one time, or you have to make the slim, then you, you bring another two Raqqas in case you have to pray for Raqqa? 
to be yeah, yeah, Omar, the last segment of your question, no. the last segment of your question wasn't clear. Okay, your question what is I'm about say, what I'm saying. Go ahead. Is it oh, is it permissible to pray four rakah with one tahiyat, or you can you only pray two rakah and then you tell, you make taslim and then you make <clears> again two rakat unless you want to pray four rakat. Okay. Uh, this is my first question. And then the second question is regard. Mm. That they will see Allah without anything clear, with a clear view. But then we have again another teaching that Muslims, uh, only believers will see Allah in his clear view and without any hijab them but regarding the non we know that also we'll see that there is a teaching indicating that they to Allah all they will answer Allah like without any intermediary how we with the translation of this chef uh, Omar Akhi Omar the first part yeah. of your second question your voice uh, was off we couldn't hear you so what is your second question again oh. about hijab and non-muslims I believe the second question was regarding about the Muslims seeing Allah as their second reward after entering Jannah. No. In a clear view. But we have also in a way, in, I don't know the authenticity of it, but it's indicating that non Muslims, yani when after, not non Muslims, yani people who are Ahl Nar, yani people who enter the hellfire, they will be answering Allah directly. Then how do we narrate this too? Where the, non -mu the, the Muslims will see Allah in his clear view as the, next, the, the other reward after entering Jannah. Mm. Yet also the non-believers will, will see him when they are answering their, you know, something like that. Fana'udhu billah. Barakallahu fi jazakallahu khairan. Brothers and sisters, it's time to take a short break and inshallah we'll be back in a few minutes to take some more of your questions and answer those pending questions. Stay tuned. Circle 5, we will focus on the universal signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as mentioned in the Quran. The universal signs, the favors of Allah, the ways of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth. <laughs> wisdom behind the mention of many of the universal signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran is to establish the evidence of the Tawheed, the oneness of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to fill the hearts with these evidences, with these signs, so the hearts will be full of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the deeds that fill these hearts with the love of Allah, the hope for the rewards from Allah, the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> We know the creation of Allah, the heavens, the earth, what's in between, but there is nothing like the book of Allah, the speech of Allah, to describe to us the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Join us in Quran Circle 5. We we'll listen to the verses of the Quran, we we'll reflect upon the meanings of these verses, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who have the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their hearts as a result of them.
these times that we are going through today where people are fighting with each other to establish superiority. Join me as we go through lessons from Surah Al-Hujrat. are the transmitters of the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. They carried his message and his legacy generation after another. And they are the one who carried this light to the whole world. The Life of the Muslim Scholars is a new series on Huda TV. Through studying their life and exploring many aspects of their lives, we will come to learn so many lessons, get motivated, and inspired by their stories, by their dedication for Islam and for the legacy of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam. Through this series, I hope that it, we will be able, inshallah ta'ala, to get motivated not to achieve only success in the akhirah, but in dunya as well. Join me, Walid Basuni, in this new series on Huda TV about the life of the Muslim scholars. Looking forward to having you. Stay tuned. Snapshots from Makkah al mukarramah The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam as an orphan. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his family. The first revelation of Iqra. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the year of the elephant. These and more, bi idhnillahi ta'ala, we will discuss in our program entitled Snapshots of Makkah al mukarramah come to understand that to be a Muslim, to be someone who says they've surrendered and submitted to the will of God, is to be in harmony with everything around you and to be a benefit to everyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator, he gave us a life plan. He told us what to do. He, he gave us, you know, goals and what he expects from us. It has roots in Islam because the first man who was created Adam, he was neither a Jew or Christian. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Our phone numbers will appear on the bottom of the screen for the reminder. And um, Sister Ummu Muhammad from the UK had a second question about the wine vinegar. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, admired the vinegar as a type of, you know, uh, udum. Yani he used to put the bread in it and eat it. And he said, Ni'mal udumul khal. So it's permissible to use uh, vinegar in general. If it is turned into vinegar by itself, even if originally it was wine. Sometimes a wine transforms into vinegar. But if that is done artificially through putting salt into the vinegar or onions or by any other means, now, yeah, vast majority of the scholars are of the view that no, it is still forbidden due to the hadith, which is a sound hadith. 
Abu Talha came to the Prophet وسلم, when Allah revealed the ayah of forbidden uh, the intoxicants and Al-Khamr. He said, Ya Rasulullah, but I have plenty of wine that I invest in it for some orphans. Can I at least turn it into vinegar? He said, no. So he poured it immediately. According to Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah have mercy on him, he said that it is permissible if it has been transformed completely and totally from wine into vinegar so that there are no traces of wine into that vinegar for now, no percentage whatsoever, even if it was done artificially. The case that we have, if I know that the food or the liquid that we have, have even a small percentage of alcohol in it, then it is impure. فَكُلُّ خَمْرٍ نجس وَكُلُّ نَجِسٍ حَرَامٍ Because every intoxicant is impure, and every impure is haram to consume, even if the percentage is insignificant. Sometimes you speak about the insignificant percentage in the topical applications and so on. When it comes to food and drink, people who cook the steak with wine, and then they say that it evaporates because it is volatile while barbecuing the steaks. But it was mixed and confused with impurities. We don't know how much is left in it. So it's not permissible for me to consume it. Keep in mind that khamr is one of the major sins to consume it, to sell it, to buy it, or to deal with it. لعن الله الخمر Allah has cursed every intoxicant and those who consume it. So if I know that this is wine vinegar, because it has been transformed naturally from wine into vinegar, it's halal. But if it was containing any percentage of wine or intoxicant in it, then it's not permissible for Muslims to use. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa a'lam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Idris from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum, Idris. Uh, Go ahead, Akhi. Uh, I have uh, three questions, basically. No. Uh, my first question is, uh, I want to know the exact uh, time of uh, Isha prayer, uh, the time ends, that we are supposed to prayer, pray the Isha time, uh, a prayer, I mean to say. And my second question is, uh, I usually pray the Easter prayer the Isha uh, while uh, praying through rakahs and uh, not going for the short in the second rakah. And the third rakah, am I supposed to read some other uh, after surah? And uh, my third question is, uh, is the uh, Barzakh time only for the uh, of the good deeds, uh, only for the people who just did? All right, got your questions, brother Idris from Pakistan, sister Umm Ni'ma from Australia. Assalamu alaikum, sister Umm Ni'ma. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Go ahead, sister Umm Ni'ma. Welcome um, to ask Okay, inshallah. Uh, my question is, um, is it okay using the mobile phone when you are in the um, bath, um, like bathroom and talking with the family friends or, you know, listening to them, hadrat? No, no, um, the toilet location is different. Is it, I don't know if it's okay or not. Type quickly, sister Umm Ni'ma, no, it is not permissible to uh, have a conversation while in the bathroom or answering the call of nature, unless if it is something emergency. But under regular circumstances, no, you shouldn't be uh, talking and conversing ah. while answering the call of nature, okay? Uh, okay, but the toilet, the toilet is different location. Um. What do you mean different location? Location doesn't affect the conversation. Like, ah, okay, okay. Okay. Right then. We, 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 we say a bathroom to the place of answering the call of nature. But if you're talking about taking a bath, taking a bath if there is no commode and answering the call of nature in that place, that is different. Okay? Talking, yeah. talking after undressing, Okay, while in the shower, there is no problem with that. I'm talking about 
while answering the call of nature. In other words, while doing number one and number two, that's not permissible. Ah, okay. All right. Okay, then. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Abu Bakr from Gambia. Assalamu alaikum, Abu Bakr. Wa alaikum assalam, Shah. Go ahead. Shah, I have a question regarding, yeah, I have a question regarding first the day of Arafat. Yeah. So sometimes the moon, when the moon is sighted in the Gambia, that will be a day after when it is in Saudi. So, um, most people here not, uh, will say, okay, we cannot when the when it is Arafat day in Saudi, so they will wait until the following day, that is night, to, uh, in the yes. Is it, uh, what is the ruling on, do we have to fast when uh, the night in Saudi or now night in the year? Okay, I got your question, brother Abu Bakr from Gambia. Assalamu alaikum. Muhammad from Nigeria. Brother Muhammad, welcome to Ask Wada. <coughs> okay, try again. Uh, <coughs> Sister Saadiya from the KSA asked about <coughs> a shaheed and what he feels at the time of death. First of all, when the Prophet وسلم, asked the companions, Ma ta'udduna shaheed afikum? Whom do you consider a shaheed, a martyr? They said the one who lies on the battlefield while fighting the non-believers for Allah's sake. He said, إِذَنْ شُهَدَاءُ أُمَّتِي لَقَلِيلٌ In this case, the number of martyrs in my ummah are few. You know, because the number of shuhada throughout the life of the Prophet ﷺ on the battlefield was not even hundreds, maybe less than a hundred. Okay, so who is a shaheed? The Prophet ﷺ rodened the area of al-shuhada, he said, al-harq shaheed, wal-hadm shaheed, wal-mabtoon shaheed. And that explains that a person who dies with a disease in his or her abdomen, cancer, liver cirrhosis, renal failure, all of that shaheed, um, stomach cancer, such people are shuhada. A woman, Tamutu bi yani she is pregnant or while giving birth due to pregnancy, she dies due to that. She's a shahida as well. A person who died due to burn, he was burned. Or he was in a building and it collapsed on top of him or her, is a shaheed. So such people are shuhada. But there is a difference in the treatment of a shaheed who dies on the battlefield and a shaheed who dies due to such sickness or uh, an accident such as burning fire or collapsing a building or an earthquake or things of this nature. What is the difference? The shaheed who dies on the battlefield, we don't have to uh, remove their clothes and put them in a shroud or a coffin and there is no even need for Salatul Janaza. Those people Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stated in the Quran they are already alive with the Lord being provided. وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتَ بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُزَّقُونَ The ayat, there are many ayat in this regard. But the shaheed who dies due to cancer, liver cirrhosis, renal failure, uh, burn, um, collapse in a building or whatever, yeah, we apply whatever we apply for a person who died a normal death. We wash the body, we enshroud the body, and we offer Salatul Janaza. So the treatment is different. The shaheed who dies on the battlefield, the Prophet ﷺ indicated that he would get hurt only like as a sting, as I say, but afterward there is no pain. There is no pain nor suffering. While a shaheed who dies due to um, some of the previous ailments or diseases, may end up suffering for months or for years. And this kind of suffering eliminates their sins. And when they don't have any sins, it elevates them into higher ranks before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second question, uh, or actually Umar's question from Bahrain, 
he asked about uh, seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in paradise. And he said that Ahlul Nar will get to speak to Allah, so they will get to see Allah as well. And then what is the privilege that, that the believers would have over Ahlul Nar if all will get to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al Mutafifin, Kalla innahum ar rabbihim yawma idin la mahjubun. So the Almighty Allah said about the dwellers of fire on the day of judgment, they will be barred from their Lord. They will not get to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the sound hadith, when Allah the Almighty admits the believers into heaven, may Allah make us among them. And then will ask them, Oh my servants, are you happy? Of course, we're the happiest. How couldn't we be happy? While you have forgiven us all our sins and admitted us to paradise, what else could we need? Could we even dream of? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one hadith says, Ridwani fala aschatu alaykum abada to grant you my pleasure so I will never be displeased with you. In another narration, the Almighty Allah will appear to them and there is no reward greater than that to get to see the Almighty Allah. But Ahlul Nar will not get to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى The person who deliberately turned away from the path of Allah will be actually resurrected on the day of judgment as blind. The ayat were said to Adam alayhi salam since he was sent down to earth with his wife. وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى قَالَ رَبِّ لِمَ حَشَرْتَنِي أَعْمَى وَقَدْ كُنْتُ بَصِيرًا قَالَ كَذَلِكَ أَتَتْكَ آيَاتِي فَنَسِيتَهَا وَكَذَلِكَ الْيَوْمَ تُنْسَى So Allah said to Adam since he came down to earth with his wife Eve the person will turn away from my reminder, from my prophets, from my messages so their life shall be miserable and then on the day of judgment, they will be resurrected as blind. Ayah number 124, Surah Taha, brothers and sisters. Seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment is in fact the greatest reward. It is not just uh, an act that will take place. It is the topmost part, it's karama. It is the highest reward that the believers will get to see when they settle in paradise. May Allah make us among them. So the disbelievers will be barred from seeing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the sound hadith which is collected by uh, the great Imams Bukhari and Muslim and narrated by Abu Huraira, when they asked the Messenger of Allah, will we get to see Allah in Jannah? He said, do you have any problem seeing the sun in midday or the moon on a full moon night? They said, no. He said, similarly by Allah, you will see Allah as clear as that. وُجُوهٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ نَاظِرَةٌ إِلَى رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَةٌ So this is exclusively for those who have bright faces, Ahlul Jannah. Why? Because they will be looking or they will get to look at Allah the Almighty. May Allah make us among them, Brother Umar. I don't think I got your second question. It reads from Pakistan quickly. The Isha time begins when the red twilight disappears. When the after the after sunset there is some sort of red twilight in the horizon when that disappears an hour later an hour and a half later that is the beginning of the time of isha it can last until one third of the night and until even the middle of the night and it is preferable if the imam agrees with the community to postpone the isha prayer to one third of the night this is uh, definitely permissible but for you to begin praying Isha when this twilight, red twilight, uh, disappears. Uh, reciting a surah after Al-Fatiha is only prescribed in the first and the second rakah, not in the third, not in the fourth, if it is a four rakah prayers. The difference between Al-Barzakh for the believers and non-believers is the difference between Al-Jannah and an nah The hadith is kind of long. Uh, unfortunately, we ran out of time to share it with you. Uh, right now, perhaps if we begin uh, next episode with it, uh, or if I have a chance, inshallah, uh, next episode, I shall remind uh, you and the viewers with the hadith. But the barzakh, which, which is the life between this life and the hereafter, 
while people in the graves ومن ورائهم برزخ إلى يوم يبعثون the believers will get to see their seats in heaven and the non-believers will get to see their seats in hellfire so it will be as means of reward or as means of punishment whenever a person dies his personal day of judgment actually starts last uh, or finally Abu Bakr from Gambia the day of Arafah Abu Bakr if in Gambia you have a Muslim league or ministry for Muslim um, affairs who go every month to determine the beginning of the lunar month now we are on Dhul Qa'da so they checked it out and they said today is the first of Dhul Qa'da even if it is different than uh, uh, Mecca that's perfectly fine you can go with them they determine the beginning of Ramadan and the Eid day but if in your country they don't do that and only it comes to um, the Eid or the Arafah day and they say we're different then you can just simply go whenever it is announced that in Mecca the pilgrims are standing today in Arafah because it is the ninth day of the month of Dhul Hijjah so fast on that day because now this is the, the greatest annual meeting for all Muslims uh, ever where millions of people get there representing the entire globe so the day of Arafah is most definitely the day of Arafah the ninth day of the month of Dhul Hijjah and the Prophet Sallallahu said with regards to fasting that day whoever observes fasting on the day of Arafah his sins of the previous years will be uh, of the previous year will be forgiven and the sins of a year to come will be forgiven as well may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all forgiveness I think we're done with all your questions until next episode I leave you all in the care of Allah wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Allah is my heart's speech your mercy is what I beseech keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deen allow me to advance help me Permit me to pass the ultimate test Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test Allah is my heart's speech Your mercy is what I beseech